Okay. All right. Welcome. This is the April 14th, 2020 city council meeting. We're going to uh, start with the close first. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. I will be giving a roll call orally. Council Member Brenner? Here. Council Member Dixon? Here. Member Duffield? Here. Council Member Hartman? Here. Council Member Muldoon? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Avery? Here. Mayor O'Neill? Here. All right, so uh, one thing we don't have on the agenda that we normally do that I'm going to insert in real quickly our clarification of items on the consent calendar and I'll go by order from left to right, my left and right for on the dais. So I'll start with Mr. Herdman. Do you have any clarification of items on consent? No, I don't. All right, Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, I do, Mayor. Um, item five. And eight, uh, I didn't, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I did not want to pull these items, but I am, uh, as we all are concerned about the city's financial situation. So if the city manager would just comment, I know we're going to be in, the, in a future meeting look at, looking at a revised budget process or financial situation for the city, but you, could you just comment on why you recommend these items to be, be approved tonight, please? Yeah, sure. Um, definitely. Um, you can hear me, right? I'm on. <clears throat> okay. Um, for the items that are on five, actually five, six, and eight, um, we're very carefully evaluated. We are very closely monitoring all our expenses. Um, but what's very important is that we maintain and um, keep our, our current infrastructure, existing infrastructure in good working order. And this is where these really come into play here, particularly on the, the playground refurbishment and our street uh, slurry seal program. And so that has been a priority to, for us. We've put funding aside for these items. I'd note that for the playground uh, refurbishment project, it is building excise funds. These are fees that are paid when there's projects that come through. They're specifically for when there's additional work um, um, that puts more, um, um, use on our system that these funds are used to help um, replace or rehabilitate um, those types of facilities. Um, and then I'll note on the um, on number uh, eight that you had brought up that that also is um, looking at uh, replacing a fire engine and we do put funds away. We have a good policy and practice here of uh, building up an, a fleet equipment replacement fund. Um, and so when the time comes and it's appropriate to do so, that we um, have the funding to be able to do that. And I'll note in particular for that piece of equipment, it is for um, specifically that it could be used for wildland um, purposes, which we do not have at this time. Um, so it will uh, provide additional um, um, service um, for our community um, and at a lower cost of what it's replacing to. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Muldoon. I have none. All right, uh, Ms. Brenner. I also had a question on item five, Grace. In Jim Mosier's um, correspondence with us, he said that a quick review of the chart on the building excise tax suggests that in the pre-Prop 13 world, the tax was last set at a fixed dollar amount of, of 21 cents per square right. foot and that that has not been updated for inflation or other changes in more than 40 years. He said one has to wonder if the 21 cent per square foot is still an appropriate amount. Have we looked at that? You know, I'll have to get back with our finance department to see when that uh, that fee was last looked at, um, or the tax, I should say, and see if um, an adjustment's necessary. We do evaluate our fees annually, but we usually do them on a cycle, so I'll, I'll have to look into that further and get back to you. Okay, that'd be great. That's it. Okay, uh, Mr. Duffield? I have none. Mr. Avery? None. All right. I have none also. So uh, as we move into public comments on non-agenda items, let me just briefly mention that I will go into greater depth because I suspect more people will be watching at seven o'clock, but for purposes of tonight, uh, we have two options for public comments. One is in our community room, and then the other is by phone call uh, tonight. 
we will have two phone call phone uh, numbers for this particular item the number that you can call in to have a public comment is 949-270-8165 again 949-270-8165 so we'll start the public comments on non-agenda items with uh any members of the public who are in the community room Do we have any Okay, uh, then do we have any public comments on the phone line? How do we know it? We're just checking for anyone watching right now. We're checking just a moment. Okay, we have no phone call for public comments on this particular item. So Mr. Harp, closed session, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. The City Council will adjourn to closed session to meet with legal counsel regarding the case of Susan Riddle versus the City of Newport Beach, and that's item number 3A on the agenda. All right, so we will be uh, recessed until our 7 o'clock regular meeting for my fellow council members. Uh, please wait to discuss any of this until we get the all clear sign on the technology side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for being here for the seven o'clock council meeting on April 14th, 2020. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Councilmember Brenner? Here. Councilmember Dixon? Here. Councilmember Duffield? Here. Councilmember Herman? Here. Councilmember Muldoon? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Avery? I see him. <laughs> Mayor O'Neill. Here. Mr. Harp, do we have a closed session report? Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. There's no closed session report this evening. All right. Tonight, we're going to have the invocation by Councilmember Dixon and the flag salute by Councilmember Herdman. <coughs> Over there now. All right. Let us say a prayer for these times. Creator God, give us the strength to meet the health crisis with COVID-19 looming around us in the city, county, country, and the world. Our hearts burst for those suffering with the virus at Newport Beach and beyond. We pray now for their healing. We offer our deepest sympathy to those who have lost loved ones. Enlighten scientists and researchers that they may discover the right vaccine against the pandemic disease. Guide doctors and nurses and all medical, can, all medical technicians and first responders working with those who are infected to take correct actions for their care. Protect all medical staff, our families and friends caring for those who are ill. Help our Newport Mesa parents working from home and teaching their children. Encourage our children during this difficult time when they may be afraid. Be with our seniors who may be alone. Help us to help them with our city's resources. 
bring together the governments and governmental agencies around the world to work together to eradicate this health threat. Hold us all together in Newport Beach so that we may, and our neighboring cities, so that we may find creative ways to be kind citizens in this uncertain time. In your name we pray, amen. Okay. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you very much. So a few introductory notes on how we'll be proceeding tonight. Uh, as you can see, we have joined other government meetings and have gone virtual. Uh, some cities have invited public comments to be only by writing and then read into the record by the clerk. Rather than do that, our staff has worked hard to get a functioning meeting that allows for real-time public comment through dial-in. We'll be using two different phone numbers tonight for public comments. Each item will use only one of those phone numbers, and then we'll switch to the other phone number when we switch items. I will announce the proper phone number when we call up the item, and that phone number will also be flashed across the bottom of the screen while people are watching on NBTV or streaming on the internet. When you call, you will be placed on hold until it is your turn to speak. Please note that only 20 people can remain on hold at a time. If you call in to speak on an item and then that line is busy, please just call back in just a few moments. We appreciate the written comments on items before us tonight, which have been distributed to council. And then one other note, uh, item three on the consent calendar is not properly placed on the consent calendar because it's soliciting council input. Under the council policies, I'm going to move it to current business, which means it's going to be placed uh, last on our council agenda tonight. Uh, so with that, I'm going to briefly take on the role of our library services director, Tim Heatherton, to briefly discuss National Library Week uh, he has called the following list the seven coolest things about the library. Last year, the Central Library and the Mariners, Balboa, and CDM branch libraries welcomed nearly a million patrons, circulated 1.2 million items, and entertained 72,000 program attendees. 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten is a year-round reading program designed to help parents prepare their children for school. Research has shown that children get ready to read years before they begin their school education. This is an excellent way to get your child ready to learn. Uh, the eBranch, the uh, eBranch use, you can use your library resource 24 seven from anywhere with internet access. The library subscribes to dozens of valuable databases and offers downloadable eBooks and audiobooks, e-magazines and streaming video. And I suspect a lot of you have learned that in the last few weeks. Uh, for passports, Newport Beach Public Library is an authorized United States passport acceptance facility. Newport Mesa Pro Literacy is a program of the Newport Beach Public Library that provides free literacy instruction to adults who live or work in the Newport Beach area. Our dedicated volunteers have helped hundreds of people improve their English skills. In doing so, these volunteers have helped change lives. The Media Lab and Sound Lab, located on the lower level of the Central Library, offers patrons access to specialized software and equipment for digital audio and visual production. And last but not least, the Friends of the Library Bookstore. The proceeds from the Friends of the Library Bookstore and used book sales go directly to the Newport Beach Public Library to help fund children's and adult programs, collections, and special purchases. In 2019, the Friends donated $296,377.21 to the Newport Beach Public Library, to which I say thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. City of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages participation, public comments, and generally as to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. City Council has discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non agenda items. As a courtesy, please, please stop on top. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so we will be going on to City Council announcements and oral reports from City Council on committee activities. Mr. Herdman. I have nothing. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dixon. I have nothing. Thank you. All right. Mr. Muldoon. None. All right, Ms. Brenner? None. Mr. Duffield? None. Mr. Avery? None. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot either. Um, I will say just as a quick A1 in light of uh, some of the discussions that have been going on, 
at the state and county level, I'd like to uh, I'd like to a one a uh, the formation of a business reopening committee. So for the next meeting, all right, we'll go to matters which council members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. Um, the uh, the matter to be voted on. This is a non discussion item. The matter to be voted on is evaluation of current budgeted capital projects for potential six month hold of lower priority projects due to the fiscal impacts of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna take a show of hands on whether you would like to see this come back at the next meeting. Can I make a friendly amendment? Is that possible, is that allowed? Not on this particular item, but when it comes back, well, I'll tell you what, what, what is- what Well, I'm like? just going to add, and program spending in addition to capital projects and, cap and program spending. And also, aren't we going to be discussing this? We'll be, so at the fi at finance committee, so the finance committee is not gonna be talking about the CIP, it'll be talking about the budget itself. So this, this would not, this, this particular item will not be discussed at the finance committee, although it, it would eventually come to us through the budget program, but- The program spending will Yeah, so I think the program, so the program spending would probably come anyway under this item for CIP, if I, okay. if I understand it correctly. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. Let's um, put your hands up again if you'd like to see this come back. That's unanimous, seven zero. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, before we move to the consent calendar, this is the time I'd like to just point out the phone number for uh, dialing in. We do have two options tonight for public comment. The first is uh, we have the community room open. And so we'll go to those, the people who are in the community room first for public comments, and then we will take public comments uh, by phone. This particular uh, item is the consent calendar item. If you would like to call in, Pardon me. If you would like to call in for public comments on the consent calendar, uh, the phone number for that is 949-270-8175. Again, the last digits are 8175. All right, so um, Madam Clerk. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion, items one through eight. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any <clears> items <throat> for the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right. Okay. Before, um, before I do this, I'll just note real quickly, item seven has been pulled by staff from consideration. I've moved item three to the current business calendar. All right. With that, do we have any, um, are you pulling anything? I'll start with Mr. Sorry, I'll start with Mr. Herdman on this one. No, I'm not pulling anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dixon? I'm not pulling anything. Mr. Muldoon? No. Ms. Brenner? No. All right, um, Mr. Duffield? None. Mr. Avery? None. And I have none. Uh, all right, so Mr. Avery, do we have a motion? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I move the balance of consent uh, calendar items one through eight with three, item three being moved to current business, item seven being removed from the agenda. And uh, we have amendment on item eight, and that's amending recommendation B on that particular subject. I'll second the motion. All right, seconded by Mr. Herdman. We'll go out to public comment. So we'll first start with members of the public who are in the, um, in the community room. Thank you, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council. My name is Jim Moser. Uh, I had a question about item number seven, which is being pulled from the agenda. Uh, th this item is Google 11 maintenance and repair agreement having to do with security cameras and alarms. And according to the staff report, the council awarded the contract back in November, staff apparently voided that contract and the current item says that they're recommending 
a new service agreement with a company called RG Systems. The original vendor was willing to do this work for, for three years for $132,000. A new vendor, RG Systems is charging $190,000. I cannot tell from the staff memo, which was in the lobby, it says they're working with the vendor on their ability to meet the bond requirements. Does that mean they're working with RD Systems, the new vendor at the high cost, or does it mean that they're working with the old vendor whose contract they seem to have avoided at the lower cost, which would be Amtec Total Security? Which vendor are they now working with? Thank you. Any other comments on the Room, I, okay, seeing none. Do we have any comments on the phone for the consent calendar? No, okay. So we'll bring this back. Um, Ms. Leung, would you like to respond to the question about item number seven? Um, we have uh, Dave Webb, uh, Public Works Director here um, to be able to respond. All right, Mr. Webb. See, working with the second vendor, it had to do with a bar yeah, issue. Not, so hang on. All right, Mr. Webb, just a moment. Are you, yeah, you were muted, so we've unmuted you. So go ahead now and restart, please. Thank you. We're currently working with the second vendor and his proposals to see if we can work out some amenable way to move this contract forward for probably a one-year term right now. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, um, I'm going to be going down into the roll call vote on the, uh, on the consent calendar motion. So, Mr. Herdman? Aye. Ms. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Muldoon? Aye. Ms. Brenner? Aye. Mr. Duffield? Aye. Mr. Avery? Aye. I am an aye as well, so it passes unanimously. Um, all right, so now is the time for public comments on non-agenda items. I'll give you just a moment because I need to make sure that you have the phone number for that. The phone number, if you'd like to make non-agenda co public comments, is 949 270 8175. Again, it's 949 270 8175. First, we'll go in the community room. Do we have any public comments on non agenda items? I see, I see one standing, so just a moment. Hi, my name is Jalil Rashid Shabazz. Um, I have a, a title, I go by Laird, but that, that's besides the point. My question is, um, where is the technology standpoint um, within Orange County and Newport as a whole? Where do we stand in the future of technology? So this is the time for comments and, and not questions. So if we can answer your question, we will after the comments. Okay. All right, thank you very much. All right, do we have any public comments for non-agenda items through the phone? We do, okay, great. Operators are standing by. <laughs> so this is the time for comments and, and not questions. So if we can answer your question, we will after the comments. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Do we have any public comments or not agenda items? Okay, so uh, if you are gonna make public comments, just a quick note, it, please mute your phone. Uh, I'm sorry, mute your television or your computer, whatever you're listening to. All right, uh, go ahead with your first, with public comment. Hi there, this is Charles Klobe. I'm calling partially to test the system. I can report that after I was given, uh, put on hold, I was given a recording that sounded like Will's voice telling me to mute the television, but that's while you were waiting and not hearing anything, so there's a little glitch there. My, um, Unfortunately, it is a question. It's regarding the 
Finance Committee meeting and tonight's council meeting, first I applaud you for having local commentary available from the community room. I'm wondering if you're going to handle the Finance Committee meeting the same way, or is it only going to be call-in as the agenda says? Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments on the phone? All right, if you can hear my voice, go ahead and start speaking. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Jonathan O'Connell. I'm a Lido Island resident, and I'm calling just about um, the decision to, oh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being calm and thoughtful uh, regarding closing the beaches um, and not seeming to <clears throat> overreact uh, or uh, react nearly as strongly um, in some of the way other cities are establishing uh, overly restrictive mandates um, on some of the responsible people who are finding a balance between following the, the protocols recommended uh, for safe social distancing, but yet not feeling as though you need to uh, sort of um, mandate those restrictions so severely. Um, a comment that I wanted to make was regarding the, um, <clears throat> the data and the analysis that was done in reviewing um, and, and deciding to restrict vacation rentals uh, for six months. So everything that I've read and from what I can tell, it looks as though the, the time frame was somewhat arbitrary. And um, is there a way to review this if we continue to see that the models for COVID-19 and the infectious uh, spread has been in large part overstated and it's now coming into much more um, uh, lower control values? Uh, is there a way to go back and, and amend the six month period only because um, friends and, and colleagues that I'm talking to in the, in the community are just growing more and more concerned about just the economic impact of some of the firm decisions that have been made. And, and I see you're sort of forming a kind of getting back to work uh, committee, which is great. Uh, but how, how seriously are we taking that now that the public health crisis, at least the surge appears to be lessening and now focusing on really getting Newport Beach economically back on track? Thank you, I uh, appreciate that. We'll, uh, I'll address that in just a moment, but I will just clarify it was six weeks and not six months. Um, uh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, we'll come back around. All right, um, do we have any other call-ins? Okay, all right, next speaker, please. Okay, if you can hear my voice, go right ahead, start speaking. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Carol Crane, and on behalf of the Crane family, we want to thank the City Council for leading us in the right direction during this uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary time. Um, I also wanted to do a shout out to uh, Mayor O'Neill for his lovely letter that he wrote to all the CDM seniors. That was really a, a beautiful letter, and it acknowledged um, the, I guess, the um, tough times that seniors in high school and, I guess, college, too, really, are encountering as far as their um, future and, and the fact that they're missing out on a very important traditional um, ritual. So thank you for having a heart, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Crane. All right, I think we have one more speaker. Oh, I guess we lost her. All right, um, Ms. Crane, if you'd like to send something in, just you can send me an email or you can call back in. And we'll, we'll we'll get your last couple your your last minute there. All right, if you can hear me, um, go ahead and start speaking, please. Hi, if you can hear me, go ahead. If you've called in for public speaking, uh, a public comment, you can hear me, go ahead. No, okay. All right, so that ends public comments on non-agenda items. We're gonna go into public hearings now. We're going to go to item number nine. Uh, item number nine is the appeal to planning commission approval for the garden office and parking structure proposed at 215 Riverside Avenue 
Before I do that, I want to make sure that we have both appellants counsel and applicants counsel. So before we before we even start, I want to make sure we have both of them. So I'm looking at our the reason I'm looking this way for anyone wondering is that's I'm looking for folks who are handling our IT as we move along. Pardon me. So what's the question? Uh, okay, we're going to be flipping in between both of them. So let's go with applicant first on the screen and then I can we can flip over to the appellant. But do we have them both at least online? We do. Okay. All right. So before I open the public hearing, um, I'd like to make sure I ask for a clarification from uh, Mr. Harp. Mr. Harp, do you have any clarifications or um, uh, explanations on this item before we before I open the public hearing. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. So our office has been working with both the applicant and the applicant, the applicant to see if uh, we can resolve their differences related to this appeal. And it appears that they are very close to coming to a resolution. And I would urge the city council to continue this matter for two weeks to give them additional time to resolve their concerns. It sounds like they're very close to working this out. And I think that that's in the interest of everyone in the community. Okay, so before I move forward with the city attorney's uh, recommendation, I do want to find out whether the appellant, the applicants and appellants attorneys agree. And I can see both of them on the screen. So let's start first with the appellant's attorney. So the appellant's attorney, Ms. Forey, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can, Mayor O'Neill. And um, as the applicant's counsel, um, um, we are in agreement with the recommendation of the city attorney. Okay, uh, Mr. Ehrlich, can you hear us as well? I can. Okay, and do you agree with the recommendation that has come from our city attorney? We do as well. Okay, all right, then um, at this time and in light of that, I'm gonna be, be making a motion to continue the item to the next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All right, I'll a second from Mr. Duffield. Um, and before I move to public comment on the motion, do we have any questions from council members? Okay, seeing none. All right, so uh, we received a lot of uh, public comments on this item in writing. And so um, I'd like to just make sure that I do two things. First, I would like to make sure that you know what the phone number is to call in for public comment. The first is 949-270-8165. And so, uh, I'd like to just note briefly that because we have not opened the public hearing on this and have instead made a motion to continue the item two weeks, I'd ask folks when they're calling in to talk on this item that they uh, limit their their um, public comments to the continuance itself. So with that, I'm going to open it up to public comment first into the community room and then we'll go to the phones. So do I have any public comment on this item in the community room? All right, seeing none, we'll go to the phones. Um, do we have any public comment on the phone? Really? It's amazing. Okay. Like there is a you know what? I, all right, so there is a delay. Just real quickly, I, I, want to do, I do want to make sure that if we are allowing for this. There is about a 30 second delay between this, the MBTV feed and what we are doing. So. I'm going to sit here in silence for 30 seconds and just allow, if people would like to call in, again, I'm just reminding everyone that the, the, the public comments are on the continuance motion and not on the on the project itself. So Mary, during the silence, can I do a pitch on Rick Steve's tour of Europe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so funny. All right. I think since I gave the phone number, it's probably been about 30 seconds. Do we have any calls for on this item? No. Okay, so I'm going to bring this back. And um, do I have any discussion? All right, seeing no discussion, uh, we'll go down the line. Mr. Herdman? Yeah, I, I vote yay. All right, Ms. Dixon? Yes. Mr. Muldoon? Aye. Ms. Brenner? Aye. Mr. Avery? I'm sorry, Mr. Duffield? Aye. Mr. Avery? Aye. I vote aye as well. So that's a unanimous vote to continue this item two weeks. All right, uh, moving to item number 10. 
ordinance numbers 2020-11 and 2020-12. Uh, I don't believe we need a staff report. Does anyone disagree? Yeah. All right, seeing none. Um, are there any questions from council members on this item? Okay, seeing none. Uh, We'll go out to public comment. As a quick reminder, the public comment phone number for this item is 949-270-8175. And so we'll first give the opportunity to any community room who would like to speak on this item. Do we have public comments on this item? All right, seeing none, I will go out to the phone lines. Do we have any public comment on this item? No. I'm not surprised. Okay, so do I have a motion on this okay. item? I make a motion to right, support the staff recommendation. All right, Ms. Dixon makes a motion to uh, approve staff recommendation. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Duffield. Um, we'll now vote. Let me read um, the ordinance titles. Okay, go ahead. Ordinance number 2020-11 and ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach adopting zoning code amendment number CH 2019-008 to amend setback map S1A West Newport as set forth in section 20.80.040 setback map of Title 20 planning and zoning of the Newport Beach Municipal Code applicable to the property located at 6501, 6503 Seashore Drive, in ordinance number 2020-12 and the ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach adopting local coastal program amendment number LC 2019-007 to amend setback map S1A West Newport as set forth in section 21.80.040 setback map of Title 21 Local Coastal Program Implementation Plan of the Newport Beach Municipal Code applicable to the property located at 6501 and 6503 Seashore Drive. All right. So I will take the vote. I'll, I'll tally the votes now. Uh, Mr. Herdman, how do you vote? I vote in favor. Ms. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Yes. Muldoon? Aye. Uh, Ms. Brenner? Aye. Mr. Duffield? Aye. Mr. Avery? Aye. I vote aye as well. So uh, now we're going to get into current business, item number 11. Uh, I will ask for a staff report on this from, I believe, Mr. Gerges. So we'll just let him get situated. Well done on the mask, Mr. Gerges. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Give right. us a second. No problem. When you're ready. Uh, oh, while he's setting up, I will just say, if you'd like to make public comment on this item, the phone number for this item is 949-270-8165. Again, the last four digits on that are 8165. <clears throat> Okay, hey, Mr. Mayor, if we're ready. Just a moment. <coughs> All right, Mr. Jurgis, go ahead. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Simone Jurgis, Community Devel Development Director. With me, I have Jim Campbell, who's also the Deputy Community, De Community Development Director, and I have Ben Zadiba, um, who is our Senior Planner. So they're here to answer questions also. So this item is the uh, professional services agreement for the um, our housing element update. And as many of you know, we have to provide a housing element, an updated housing element by October 2021. And the reason why we need to do that is that you know we've been um, assigned, uh, not technically, a draft number, a draft arena number of 4,832 units. So. You know, we, we want to appeal that number. You know, we've talked about that's a very high housing unit number. We don't have to build these units, but we have to zone for these units. And we have to do that and, and have policies in place that provide um, a number of affordable housing units um, in our housing element. So just a little brief update on the RENA numbers. We're waiting to get our final allocation of the 4,832 units. That has been delayed because of SCAG, who is our regional council. They've been cut out on hiatus because of the pandemic. They're supposed to reconvene and approve the final allocation May 7th. 
And so far, we've heard is that they're going to go ahead with with that date of May 7th hearing. They're probably going to do uh, telephonically, just as our council is. And then after that is um, finalized, we will have a final allocation number of the 4832. That's what we anticipate. From there, we'll, we get a 45-day window to file an appeal. And we've already started drafting our appeal and putting those thoughts together already. So we, we have, um, we, we're way ahead of schedule on getting our appeal done, but that's, that's kind of the behind the scenes of, and that's the update of RENA. So to update our housing element, we need a consultant. So we went out to an R, did an RFP process. We released it back in December with a due date of January um, 2020, and we got no responses. So we went back out, talked to all the consultants, and we were able to get a, a couple of responses back, and really only one for housing, and we got one for um, traffic and circulation. So this, the, the professional services agreement that's in front of the city council this evening, it is an agreement for Kimley Horn. They will be the prime, um, the prime consultant. They will be handling our housing element um, amendments, um, are, and then from there, they'll have sub-consultants with um, two traffic firms, um, LSA and Urban Crossroads, and they both have different expertise. We also have Kaiser Marston as one of our subs, and they'll be doing our market and fiscal analysis. So Kimley Horn, we're going to rely on Kimley Horn to do a lot of this heavy lifting with regards to um, updating our housing element, doing the EIR, and writing all the technical requirements. The, that, that's the consultant side of it. So as we talked in the past, we've always talked about that staff needs guidance. Sorry. Staff needs guidance with regards to um, um, the update of the housing element policy guidance. So before I talk about policy guidance, let me talk about a little bit of the cost. It is a very expensive item. Um, there are very few consultants that are available to do this work. Kimberly Horn has mentioned to us that we're probably the almost the last ones that they're going to take on board because they're up to capacity also. All the other firms either are too busy or really kind of too scared to work on this housing element. This housing element is the most challenging housing element that has ever come across the cities in the state of California. And the reason why is because the state has changed the compliance rules. The rules are now harder and tougher. On the screen there in front of you, you can see the cost. You know, Kimberly Horn is $700,000. Um, all the subconsultants have their prices there. and. Um, and the total price is about $1.2 million. Just a reminder that the council did authorize staff to go for a SB2 planning grant. So we're able to, we did get awarded that grant of $310,000. So that's able to subsidize this 1.2 million. So about $900,000 out of general fund. Here's just a quick schedule. We do, and we talked about the policy committee, and this is our housing element update advisory committee. And you can see there, we have a tentative scheduled meeting for May 6, and you know we've delayed it one month because of the pandemic, but we are tentative for that date, and, and that's going to be our policy committee. That's the committee that's going to help us and guide us. Um, they're going to give us the thumbs up and thumbs down on the policies that we're going to write in the housing element and the site selection, where, where our properties can be upzoned for, um, for um, multifamily um, housing units. So that's going to be the policy committee. The council has already made their selection of the committee members. We're just waiting to get our first meeting going. Um, and if we just run through the, the schedule here, our, our whole goal at the end is to be able to submit the, our housing element um, update and our EIR. And it says 1031. Ben, is that 1015, October 15th? Within 120 days. It's within 120 days of the October 15th date. So that's, that's our schedule to update. So I'm happy to answer questions from the City Council. Thank you. Thank you. So in order for me to be able to see people, I would need to, sorry, just a moment for those watching at home. Um, can I get that, that screen filled up all the way so I can, you know what, um, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm just going to go down. There you go. Thank you. I want to make sure I see everyone. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, just Put your hand up if you could, if you would like to ask any questions. All right, I see. All right, Ms. Dixon. Hi, Simone. This is Diane. Uh, just a question, if you could go to the page with the cost estimate on it, please. <clears throat> because there are so few firms 
in the state knowledgeable on this subject matter and they're all, as you said, nearing capacity. Is this pricing in line, the fees in line with what you we've experienced in the past or what you expected or could you comment on? Yeah, yeah I, you know, we, we from, a, from a staff standpoint, you know, we've talked it through. This is, you know, we don't feel that these are excessive, even though this is a real high contract of 1.2 million. This is well in line. We, you know, from a staff standpoint, we estimated about a million dollars for everything. It's come in about a little higher, a little bit 1.2, but we don't, we don't think we're getting gouged here, um, council member. We do think this is in line of what the industry standard is. Um, you know, what the, what's expensive is doing this EIR. The EIRs are very, very expensive, very time consuming from a staff standpoint, from a consultant time standpoint. All right, and then just finally, congratulations on going after that money. I remember in Sacramento that uh, one of the staffers with Housing and Community Development said the city should apply for grants and you did and it's Newport Beach taxpayers, $300,000. So good job. Thank you. All right, um, do I, would anyone else like to ask? All right, I'll ask, uh, maybe I'll ask, but this, this is uh, Will O'Neill. So in terms of the timing, um, we, we have seen the, we have seen SCAG uh, not, they, they haven't moved forward in terms of actually giving us our number, which means that we have not reached a point where we can even file an appeal because technically we don't have our number. Is that how I understand it? I understand it that way. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. All right. But on the, on the back end, we, just, we have not received, you know, at, at least as of yet, we have not received a, uh, a, a, an extension of time in order to submit a, a, a compliant housing element. That, that's correct. And what we're hearing from the, from the League of California Cities is that the, the only, only individual or agency that can grant an extension of time, um, League has stated that the governor can do that through executive order, grant the additional extension of time. Um, and I, and I, my understanding is the League of California Cities is approaching the governor's office to request that, um, but we don't have any other information and we haven't heard any, any further extension. Okay, yeah, I mean, I just, I'll just say as a side comment, I think that we're seeing a, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing a, a rather different world right now in terms of uh, a drive for density. So hopefully that's, this is, this is one of those times where people can reconsider some of the housing policies that have, that have been coming out of Sacramento for a variety of different reasons. Um, so, all right, uh, what we're going to do now, unless I have any other requests for to speak, we'll go out to public comment. All right, we'll go out to public comment. As a quick reminder, pull this up just a moment. As a quick reminder, if you'd like to speak on this item, the phone number is 949-270-8165. So first we're going to go to uh, public comment in the um, community room. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, uh, this is Jim Mosher. Um, as the staff report indicates, this is a follow on to a more general general plan update activity that the city is conducting. We had a consultant for that called Ferns and West. Staff report indicates we still have a contract with them for about half a million dollars. Many members of the community were disappointed with that activity. I think each of you council members attended a district workshop. The council district has about 12,000 residents in it. And at those workshops, optimistically, the city heard from maybe 10 of the 10 or 12,000. Did not seem very good. Uh, it's unclear from the new agreement who is going to be running or operating the public outreach last of this. So I'm wondering if staff could provide some clarity as to how the public outreach is going to work with this new phase and what company is going to be um, managing that aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any phone calls for public comment on this item? We do, okay.
Are they on the line now? Okay. And I want to um, thank you for calling out the timeline and some of the um, possibilities that might surface to change the uh, policies, et cetera, uh, from those in charge, the governor or whoever. My, my personal concern is looking at those first couple of steps in that timeline. I don't know how the public, how I am, how the rest of the residents and the businesses in Newport Beach are going to be able to be fully participating in this process. So I'm just, that's just one concern that I have, and I hope, I, I don't know how to resolve that, but this is not, this telephonic way is not going to work, I don't think. So I'm hopeful that we can, hopefully we get some loosening around the timeline or more guidance or something in this health crisis we're in, so we can, we the public can fully participate in the process. Thank you very much. Understood, thank you. Do we have any other speakers? We do, okay, great. All right, if you can hear my voice, you can start speaking for public comment. Yep, go ahead. Oh, so if you're, if you're gonna give public comment, just a quick reminder, please do, uh, mute whatever you're watching on TV or in streaming. Go ahead. Hi there, my name is Charles Klobe. Um, you have heard tonight from Jim Mosher, both via um, written comments and verbal, and you have read from Dave Tanner, and you may shortly hear from Dave Tanner. I echo both of their concerns chiefly that the um, contract allows flexibility in our um, time frame and cost if the scope is to go down, that we don't suffer and are required to pay the full amount, but that the scope can adjust up and down based on uh, what happens in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, do we have another speaker? Great, all right, if you can hear me, Please do uh, start speaking. So for our next for our next public comment, if you can hear me, go ahead. Yes, David Tanner. Go can ahead, you hear me? I can. Go ahead, Mr. Tanner. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate your efforts to. Uh, uh, to function uh, during this uh, uh, virus pandemic. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to make sure that uh, written comments that were emailed to, to the council are considered. Uh, I don't know how you're gonna do that in this format, uh, but I wanted to let you know, I provided a bunch of uh, uh, comments earlier today via email. Thank you, Mr. Tanner, we did receive them. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, any other speakers? No, all right, let's bring it back. There are a few questions that I'm gonna bring back to that were raised during public comment. Uh, so this can be, this could go to, I'll, I'll start with Mr. Georges, but uh, any, any of our staff, Ms. Leong or Mr. Hart. So the first question uh, was about public outreach and who would be covering the public outreach portion of this. Uh, could you speak to that, Mr. Georges? Um, you know, yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. We do have Crimson West as our current uh, public outreach consultant. They, they've been put on standby until we can get our housing element advisory committee up and running. We, you know, from a staff standpoint, we need to have public outreach. And um, we, we didn't go back out to get a new um, outreach consultant. We have Crimson West. Our intent is to continue using um, Crimson West, but through the advice of the, the new committee that's been formed. Okay, and then there's a question, there's a question also about the, um, the public participation, which I, to the speaker's point, we agree that this is, this is I mean, far the, less than ideal um, for, for the situation to be what it is right now while we're going through such an important phase of our housing element update. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't disagree, and I, I 
you know, we've already canceled our first two meetings of the housing committee um, because we didn't feel confident that we would be able to move forward using, you know, at least using the technology that we had um, up until perhaps now. But I'll at least say uh, the reason I, I suspect the reason you're calling May 6th tentative is because we're still not 100% sure whether that we'll be able to move forward on that date um, given the given the current environment. So. Um, what are your generally what are your thoughts in terms of where we are in terms of public participation on something this important you know mr mayor we we really are going to rely upon our housing element committee uh, on the public participation process you know that that's our guiding um, um policy committee and our, and our board that we're going to work with you know public participation is the the key the key element of updating a housing element you know it's not going to be successful if we don't engage with the public so the idea is to work with our committee members and do more of that outreach through Kearns and West we have a website Newport together is already established and set up we've done um, a lot of meetings with the community members we've we've collected a lot of da data and we just want to continue that outreach um, through the new housing committee um, because it is it is an important element of the um, it's an important element of updating the housing element. Okay. By the way, just a side note: someone emailed me uh, about a week ago suggesting that we change the name to Newport Together, but at least six feet apart. Um, and, so then, uh, the other question that came in on the contract, and this might be a question more for Mr. Harp, was the question of flexibility of scope and timing. Uh, depending on how the state handles this process, it, we may, you know, the scope may be reduced, it may be increased, the timing of it may change. What's the flexibility in our contract for us to be able to handle situations that arise in the next 18 months? Yeah, the, co the contract provides that we can always enter into an amendment and change the scope of the work, and that's something we'll look at as we go along, but an important point that he raised. Okay. All right. Do I have any... Um, Additional questions or comments at the council level? Go ahead and just put your hand up if you need. All right, I haven't seen none. If that's the case, then do I have a motion? I'll make it. Go ahead, Ms. Support the staff recommendation. Okay, we have a motion. Second. Second by Ms. Brenner. Uh, any discussion? All right, seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Herdman? Aye. Ms. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Muldoon? No. Uh, Ms. Ms. Brenner? Aye. Uh, Mr. Duffield? Did we have, do we have him on mute? Aye, yeah, you do, you do. All right, Mr. Avery? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, um, we'll move into item number 12. Before I get, uh, before we do this item, I'll just note the call-in number for this particular item is 949. 270-8175. Again, the last numbers are 8175. All right, with that, um, uh, just note that this is uh, um, an, an oral report, so there's no action to be taken out of this, but there will be questions, I'm sure. So uh, turn this over to Ms. Leung. Okay, thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the council. Um, I have, uh, I'm just gonna make a, few brief comments. I have some slides and then I also have um, Chief Boyles and Chief Lewis also available um, to, um, and Chief Boyle to provide a brief update um, and available to answer questions as well. So let me go over to presentation, which I don't know where it went. <coughs> Okay, I need a, oh, there. Okay, you here we go. Okay. Sit there and let you see. Okay, all right. Um, as you know, we've uh, we've been working around the clock on our, our response update here. So, um, and I just want to provide just real quickly um, some of the timeline that is going on. Um, I wanted to note here, um, don't need to go through every single one of these items, but th this just highlights some of the major uh, um, orders that had come out. And you can see it's fairly early on um, that California jumped in and as well as the city and, and in the county. And really, if you look at that March 15th date when the governor began to do the, the closure of the, um, the bars and alcohol establishments, 
um, and urged high-risk individuals to isolate that um, just over four weeks now um, of when that happened. So I think that um, really uh, says now as we see our numbers um, and we see um, really see progress in um, in and see the effects and impacts of what the um, the isolation and the, uh, the stay-at-home orders um, have done for us um, through this. Um, as part of these, as we've gotten orders, um, as you um, all know, um, and as the community knows, we've done a lot of work in looking at uh, ways to maintain and, um, and enforce how we can um, with the social distancing, um, having people um, um, you know, uh, continue to stay at home. So uh, again, I'm not going to go through e each of these, uh, but it's really been a lot of work to see where the right balance is um, in ensuring that while still also providing an opportunity for our residents um, to, to um, utilize um, physical space for exercise, for their physical and mental health, um, that sort of thing. So it, it, it has been a very, um, sometimes a painful process, um, I will admit, as we try to find that right balance, but um, I think um, we're really putting the effort in um, to make sure we do this um, um, in a measured way and in a steady um, way. Um, as part of this, the other big part is education. Um, I had staff take a look and kind of provide the signage. Um, interesting, uh, we have 17 signs that have been developed over this time frame. Uh, with various messaging here to enforce the social distancing, enforce closures. We've looked at doing one ways um, for some of our circulation to promote um, um, the, the, the distancing piece and, and keeping people apart. You know, with these 17 signs, we've deployed approximately um, 1,100, 1,100 signs have been put out in various parts of the city. Through that, we have nine electronic trailers um, that are stationed, um, some at Bobo Island entry point, Peninsula entry point, CDM areas to really um, get that messaging um, and the word out um, there. Um, and I, I do think it's, it's um, and certainly the governor ha has mentioned, he mentioned it today as well, that this has had good progress. This is just a chart showing you for <laughs> the Orange County, um, the number of new cases that were reported every day since they started reporting. And you, you can see the climbs up, but I'm, I think we're very encouraged with the numbers we're seeing right now. Um, most recently, you can see that rather drop off, particularly in the last two days. Of course, two days doesn't make a trend, but I, I think it's all pointing into the right direction. And really, if you start to look kind of um, from a couple of days where we're really starting to see, you know, after several weeks of being in that social isolation point, to see that kind of um, the number adjustment um, is, is really, um, really promising um, overall. For Newport Beach itself, now this is total number of cases um, since they were reported by city, by the county. And while we had a um, initial number that was um, on the higher side on a countywide basis, and we had some climb, but you can see again, starting in early April, it's been a little more steady. The, the number of increase, while it is increasing, that, that rate of increase is more flattening. And, and that's something we really wanna um, see and, and wanna um, keep that held there. Um, so through with that, you know, as I said earlier, it, it's really, um, we're really working to make that effort to balance, you know, we want the stay at home, we want the social distancing to be happening. Um, but we also want to um, give our community, you know, the opportunity for the exercise for physical and mental um, health and well being. Um, and really, um, we've also taken um, the, the direction and the guidance from the governor um, and from the county where they've really provided a lot of guidelines and said really focus first on the education and the social pressure piece of it. And that's how we've really um, pushed on the on the enforcement side and generally and certainly Chief Lewis and um, Chief Boyles can speak to that a little further. But I think by and large, um, we've gotten good um, um, behavioral change uh, through that, um, and it and it it's it is a constant balance. Um, maybe it's a good thing that um, I get hate mail on both sides. Maybe that says what we're doing something that's you know trying to find that threading that right needle and finding that balance through that, um, and we'll continue um, to do that. Um, I think another good thing is the governor today, um, as part of his announcement, talked about what factors and indicators he's going to be looking at in terms of being able to modify that stay at order, um, stay, in, um, stay at home order there. Um, and you can see here, I, you know, and I think the key of it all, absolutely instrumental is gonna be um, the widespread um, testing, the accuracy of testing. 
um, and to be able to um, utilize that as a tool, um, as a big piece of that, um, of that looking to do adjustments there. Um, and he, he had six uh, frameworks here that you can see up on the screen um, that will help um, him determine um, uh, making adjustments there. Um, I will note, um, I mean, it's a positive thing um, that we're starting to think into the future here, but we're still a long way away. Um, when he was asked about a date um, that would be modified, he, he told the reporters, you know, I, I'm not giving you a date, you know, ask me in about two weeks. So, so he's really wanting to see the metrics and, and what comes out um, through all of that. So, so we'll be keeping close watch there too, um, through that piece. Uh, so we'll continue to uh, monitor the closure that we're closures that we have in place. We get a lot of feedback. You know, I hear a lot from both from all the council members as well as from the community. Um, the community should know we do take all your, your emails, your phone calls um, in and consider all that input as we look to see where we need to do rebalance, adjust, um, things of that nature, step into something further. Do we potentially need to draw something back? You know, that, that we really uh, spend a lot of time going through all the input that we're getting to do that. The other big piece um, for us now is also the fiscal impacts of all this. We are um, looking at um, what the current fiscal year revenue loss will be and, um, and already taken steps on the expenditure side to make sure we um, rein those in. We'll go into that in more detail with the city council um, um, at the next meeting on April 28th. Um, and with that A1 uh, adoption um, from council member Muldoon, we'll also be talking about projects um, and um, looking at areas there where um, we can put holds. Um, simultaneously, while we're doing that, this is typically the time we do our uh, budget, our uh, proposed budget uh, for the next fiscal year. So we are in the midst of doing that as well. Um, in all likelihood, because we don't have full information of where things are going at this time, um, I am looking um, to make it kind of like a placeholder budget that we put in. And it's one that we would, I fully expect to revisit. I'm thinking perhaps um, after the first quarter of the new fiscal year. So um, July, August, September. So in the early fall um, to see what kind of adjustments we would need from there. Um, and then also very mindful of um, certainly what this um, impact is, what is um, having on our businesses and our residents and um, looking at the next steps um, for us there. Um, kind of in tandem with our own look at our own fiscal picture and our operations accordingly there. So I think those um, that's the end of my um, comments here. And um, let's see, how do I get out of the presentation mode? There we go. Okay. Um, and then I have um, Chief Boyles, if, if, uh, Mayor, if that's okay to just uh, say a few comments. Please. Yep, please. Thank you. Jeff, are you uh, there? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and, and members of council. Uh, Jeff Boyle, Fire Chief. I just have a, a few points that I'd like to speak to from the operational side. And I'd like to start with um, the tremendous support that we've had from council and uh, the community and staff with regards to our planning and, and operations. Our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, has been operational since March 15th. And that, as uh, City Manager Grace Leung said, allows us to tie together all the different departments from public works, finance, tracking all the costs, MOD, PD, public safety, recreation, library. So we're all in one room and we get to discuss what our plans are and what our actions are. Countywide, our hospitals are reporting a collective 50% capacity, bed capacity as of today which is uh, trending right around between about 48 and 52% for about the past month or so. So we haven't seen a real decrease or a real increase. It's just been about the same. Uh, the latest modeling is showing that our hospitalization rate and death rate should peak this week. We technically think it was today, but uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a moving target, but we do think the peak is there. So from here on out, now what we're hoping for is you know, that steady decline and the flattening of the curve, as they say. Here in Newport Beach, we've transported five known COVID patients to the hospital. And when I say known, that means that the hospital tested them, they came out positive, and the hospital circled back and let us know as a fire department that the patient we transported was indeed uh, positive. However, since March 21st, we've responded to 
130 what we call enhanced precaution calls from dispatch. So when somebody calls 911 and they have some symptomatic uh, fever, cough, chills, shortness of breath, and back in the early days, when I say early days, I mean five, six weeks ago, if there was known travel, the dispatch centers would, would uh, give us a heads up called enhanced precaution so members would know essentially what they were getting into. So we've had 130 of those, and yesterday, April 13th, was the first day that we had zero. So we've seen a, a drop off. Some days have been as high as 12 with an average of three per day. So yesterday was zero. Um, I don't have the numbers for today yet. Our overall responses are down 22% for um, fire department from March and April of 2019 to March and April of 2020. So I think you know, common sense would say that people aren't driving cars and, and they aren't uh, going to work, aren't doing as many things as they normally do, but we have seen quite a drastic reduction in our responses. Ten of the last 11 days around the county have seen only single-digit rises in the positive cases here in Orange County, with one of those days being 10%, but we've seen 3 and 4% has not been uncommon, and one of them was uh, lower than 1% just a couple of days ago. Before 11 days ago, it was very common to be somewhere in the 20 to 40% range of positive cases day after day here in Orange County. So again, we're, we seem to be trending down. Um, we, our personal protective gear is where it should be. We have plenty for now. And now we're shifting into the mode where we're starting to try and make some difficult decisions for the coming weeks and months based on the governor's direction and the county health direction with regards to our junior lifeguard program, um, our recreation programs, our beaches and things like that. So I think we'll see a slow reintroduction of people to restaurants and, and beaches and parks and things like that. I, I wish I could tell you, but the governor couldn't tell you today either, so we just don't know where any of that's going to land. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there for anyone watching because I have been asked several times about Junior Lifeguard, such a popular program, and we're going to hold off until early or mid-May to make a decision on that one. And that's the end of my report. All right. I have Chief Lewis here as well, if you need to hear from him. If you'd like I think you'd be happy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, if you can hear us, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, John Lewis, your Chief of Police, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have regarding the police's role so far um, going forward. I know there's some questions for enforcement. I'd be happy to, to take those from you now. Uh, how about we how about we just ask? Generally speaking, over the last month, um, have we seen a uh, have we seen a crime decrease with so many people at home? Uh, what should people be looking for when they're at home these days? Certainly, we have seen an unprecedented crime decrease over during the month of of March in general, and that was we we are seeing people at home, and we're seeing less people on the streets. So our crime numbers are reflecting that. We've seen our residential burglaries trend down significantly. One that we were keeping an eye on is. There have been reports of other jurisdictions of an increase in perhaps family-related crimes or domestic violence-related crimes. And for the month of March, we stayed flat on that um, in comparison to March of 2019. So that's something we're still keeping an eye on. We're still monitoring. But at this point in the city, we haven't had, we haven't had issues with that. We have, however, have seen a couple cases where we've made some arrests of, of people out in our neighborhoods and taking advantage of um, sometimes the quiet streets to uh, go through open cars and vehicle burglaries and things like that. Now we do have suspects in custody, but we have had some, seen some issues of that recently in the past couple of weeks. So the, the same crime prevention message really remains the same, that we need to uh, make sure that we're still being vigilant and we're taking care of our properties and our vehicles and not letting people take this opportunity to, to victimize us in this way. All right. All right. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm, I'll just uh, kick off a couple of quick comments and then I'll just go down the line because I suspect um, either everyone will have a question, but I, or at least I just want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to ask Grace, uh, Chief uh, Boyles or Chief Lewis, any questions. 
first one I'll just say is um, to all of our residents who have been actually following the social guidelines, which I think is the vast, vast majority of us, just want to say thank you. Uh, you can see the trend lines are looking positive. Um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the merits of confirmed cases, whether that is a good metric of how a community is doing or a bad metric, or whether it, there's, there's a lot of questions of um, what it means. For example, we don't have a lot of data on how anyone uh, actually got the virus, whether it's through travel or, or through community transmission. Uh, we don't know how many people have recovered out of all of the numbers that we've seen in Orange County. Um, there's a lot of information we don't know, and so we, we're relying on the, the public health agencies to interpret that for us and help us out. But um, I'll just say to our residents, uh, thank you. This is an incredible sacrifice that you're going through. So um, we, we are very mindful of that, and we're trying very hard to start looking past the horizon of this and try, trying to figure out how to how to return to semblance of normalcy to eventually get to normalcy. Um, to our staff who have worked incredibly hard over the last month, many of you seven days a week, to try to accomplish what no one ever really anticipated needing to accomplish, turning a city that loves to invite people in to telling people no, to no longer come and stay safer at home. So uh, we've seen a lot of um, creative closures here and there. Uh, we've tried very hard to reduce the number of people coming in and follow, and so that, that people will follow the social guidelines. And we've been trying very hard to remind our own residents of the, <laughs> of the same thing. Uh, we are a very outdoors community. So I just want to say though, to the vast majority of people who've been following it, thank you. I think you're seeing the, um, seeing the progress there and to our staff who have worked incredibly hard, incredibly hard. Um, I want to say thank you as well. So. With that, I'm going to just go down the line again. Um, so I'll start. Mr. Herdman, do you have any questions or comments? I don't have any questions, but um, I want to say to our residents that uh, we all need to be incredibly appreciative of just the outstanding job on the part of our city manager, our assistant city manager, our department heads, our chiefs and their departments, our emergency operations center staff, and each of you as well, my colleagues on the council, uh, for, the, for the incredible job that, that you're doing uh, during this crisis. Um, we're getting good cooperation from people, constituents in District 5. Uh, we're on the honor system when it comes to these closures. And uh, I'm pleased to report that, at least in my district, that is significantly impacted with closures that uh, Compliance is good, cooperation is good. I also wanna commend our two high school principals in the city. Uh, I have two grandchildren that are seniors at uh, Newport Harbor High. Um, I wanna commend the principals in terms of uh, uh, helping to uh, coach and, and support seniors through this really rough time. There are a tremendous amount of disappointments on the part of kids. Uh, experiences that they've been working 12 years for and are not going to be able to experience. But uh, I know the principals are doing an excellent job in terms of electronic pep talks and encouragement. And Will, uh, your letter was very much appreciated by my two grandkids as well. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dixon. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I too will echo what has already been said. Our residents are really coming together in a remarkable way. And I'm just it's just astounding. And, and it's true across the country, I guess, how the community, this is being solved one community at a time. And as Grace pointed out in terms of the governor's uh, cautious optimism, uh, it this community distancing, social distancing is working. And I'm very proud of how the city and the council has approached this incrementally. And the staff as well as council have, have met and talked and conversed and discussed what's the best way to keep our community safe while at the same time not creating martial law in our community. And I think it, we've struck that balance each time we review it. We know that the weather's gonna get better in the next few days, maybe the next weekend, and that's going to really be a test of our uh, 
I guess, what do we want to say, mutual benefit cooperation because the enforcement is really peer pressure, social pressure. And that's the way Newport Beach does things in a very polite peer pressure type of way. And, and I look forward to, if, if there are still visitors who are leaving their neighborhood in violation of the governor's order to come to Newport Beach, I, I hope that they are following the necessary social distancing order because I do hear from residents, my district too, just like Mr. Herdman said, is, is heavily impacted as is Corona Del Mar, which we'll hear from shortly. And so I hear a lot from residents uh, how frustrated they are. Uh, and I'm not blaming staff, it's just visitors who are, are bringing their beach paraphernalia and walking down the sidewalks because the beach parking lots are closed. And so there's just people, we have small lots, so there residents sit in their front little square of, and try to enjoy the outside. There's no backyard. And so when visitors, non-residents are walking up and down the sidewalks going to the beach, uh, they're coming in within six feet of our residents. So uh, they're, and it's frustrating, but everybody's trying to do the best they can. And I really appreciate staff doing all these signs. I hope people are reading them because that's the only way we could deter people from coming. So I'm very grateful to staff and, and our lifeguards. They, they have a big job out there too. And uh, keeping people uh, from coming too close in a social distance kind of way. Uh, I will follow up on two comments. Um, you made Grace on the testing people have been saying, oh, and they heard the governor's message today, as I did, you know, to get the testing. Where would you suggest that people secure the tests? Is there any county health site or sites that are available to county residents or people just go to their own doctors or how do we help people? And I know the county, ochealth.gov, it's probably the best option for people to seek, but it's really, I, I've tried to find it myself and I, it just gives very general information about testing. What do you suggest we say to our residents? Oh, God. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, yeah, the, the county public health department is the one overseeing on the testing side of things. That is a good point. Um, I think we'll take a look and see if there's any um, specific links we can provide on specific testing by the county and, and the appropriate um, uh, recommendations on that from them. I did follow up um, today um, just very quickly or briefly with the uh, county CEO, um, uh, Frank Kim and um, to ask about what their testing plans were and how they were going to be, um, you know, really need to be aggressively ramping up if we're going to go into this next phases. And so he said he would be talking further with uh, with the board about that um, this week and that to expect something um, hopefully next week about kind of their planning process through that um, acceleration of testing. So um, I'll, I'll certainly keep um, the council and the, um, the community um, informed as we have that information. But also, um, we'll look at specific links on testing that we can put onto our website too that uh, residents can access. That's very good. Well, thank you for that. And then one other comment you made about the hospital beds, or we've heard this, I've heard this from the Hope uh, folks too, is that I, oh, I, Chief Boyle said this, ironically, hospital beds are empty and there's Hogue is really, and I've made this message in my communications to my constituents uh, that people, even if they don't, eat, if they're not feeling that they have the illness, they have the disease, the virus, but they may have a heart or cardiovascular problem or other uh, underlying health issue, nothing to do with the virus, but they should not hesitate to go to the hospital. They're hearing a lot of people are making uh, decisions not to go to the hospital for fear of contacting the virus and. Uh, they're focused saying if you're sick and feel that you have a, are having a heart attack or a stroke, call 911 and, and uh, we, and we don't want to take any chances with anybody's health. Um, I guess, I guess that is what I really wanted to say. I just want to say thank you to the community. This is something we're all doing together and thank you for the mayor's leadership on this. Uh, we're all trying to do the right thing. And in the spirit of doing the right thing, please listen to the county's strong encouragement that all employees at essential businesses wear a face covering while at work and all residents engaged in essential activities outside the home to do the same. That is probably one persistent complaint I get from my district residents that because of the construction activity, 
continues because it is deemed an essential business that many construction workers are not wearing face masks. And so this is, a, a, again, in our highly dense concentrated neighborhoods where there's construction, multiple construction projects, cheek by jowl, side by side on streets, uh, there are construction workers all over. And I wish there was some, some way we could encourage these the contractors. Maybe if Simone is listening, he could send some kind of a message out to the, the permit holders and construction companies. Uh, they know who they are, they're essential businesses to really follow the county's mandate on face masks. Well, I happen to agree, so oh. <laughs> there you go. All right. Are you in the construction trade? <laughs> no, we're, we're deemed essential workers. Yeah. All right, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. That's it's very flattering that we're essential workers, so well, I'm not sure we are. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Grace, very much for your team for their long hours and uh, the seriousness you put into this. Even this production you're seeing right now looks like it's a regular Zoom call, but it's not. We have staff and IT working to make sure the phone lines work and everyone was able to uh, participate. Uh, it's not ideal, but it definitely shows the caliber of staff we have um, in the city. Obviously, Chief Lewis, you're, you're used to being asked questions um, on the spot as an officer. You have to uh, often to testify in front of uh, in front of juries. But I want to bring back the fire chief for uh, for some questioning, uh, if you don't mind switching chairs with him. Hey, Chief. How are you? Good. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the video you did on, on the beach. Thanks for doing this. And of course, thank you and your team for all they're doing. Um, did you touch on uh, the numbers of infected, positive tested in the city of Newport Beach as of late? Um, I believe our last number was 87 here in Newport Beach, which climbed by one or two today. Um, as City Manager Grace pointed out, we had an initial number of 32, so that was our, our starting point. And it's been a, a steady climb up past, I think, four or five days. I don't have them right here in front of me, but it, it seems paper and off. We've had a couple days of zero, a couple days of one and two here and there. So it's climbing slowly or actually uh, leveling off, I, I would like to say. Yeah, you said something pretty positive. You think that we're in the peak week right now. Um, if this is the peak week, essentially these numbers will put us at about one per 1,000 residents that are infected and test positive, correct? Correct. Do you have the numbers, of the, um, the top three and the bottom three of uh, percentage per capita in the county? or just what cities it are than the top three, which is in the bottom three? I, Rex, can you hand that to me real quick? Or the notebook. I have them with me, Council Member Muldoon. I just need to find them. The reason why you're looking for those, the first one, the reason I'm asking these questions is because, um, it looks as if many of the efforts we're doing at the national, state, local level are working, and that, um, like most times, it, fear has not been really the beneficial driving force. It's collaboration, it's learning, it's being open to washing your hands and social distancing, and it's, it, it's good hard work preparedness, many of which lies in the hands of our staff, uh, including our police and fire departments. Um, so there's not enough thank yous to go around for their hard work and their collaboration and their homework and their extra hours, their uh, heart and souls are put in protecting our residents. And we're seeing this communities uh, throughout the US. So it's not unique to Newport Beach, but obviously it's unique to us because we've never experienced this before. And I uh, also want to encourage the residents uh, to continue to not be fearful and to try to be good neighbors, whether it's a virtual neighbor on a, on a platform or whether it's a physical neighbor uh, or if someone even in your own house, um, a, a neighbor to, to loved ones, that uh, the less we let fear affect us and the kinder we are to each other, the better we're gonna be in the end. Um, I want, I'm touching on the specific point that I'm gonna let the chief answer now that he's found his numbers because uh, Newport really is not unique. I'll let the chief first answer the question about the top three and the bottom three cities in the county. 
be able to find that if you weren't. Um, I have an, I, you and I spoke about it, so we, we have a dog park in the group. I don't have, I know Laguna Beach per capita, Newport okay. Beach for a second. That's a okay. good Last, I believe San Clemente or Villa Park was up around three or four. I don't Villa know. Park. Three. Villa Park is three? Yeah. Okay, who are the bottom three? Bottom three? Who wanted the bottom three? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Muldoon, the bottom three are City of Stanton, Seal Beach, and Garden Grove. Yeah, per capita. Per capita, and what's a what's a difference roughly? So we're about one per thousand. What are these communities? Uh, Laguna Beach is the highest with fifteen point eight four per capita, and Newport Beach is nine point seven five per ten thousand per ten thousand, and uh, the city of Stanton is. 1.27 per 10,000. Okay. Thank you. So we we discussed it. Could you? I know you and I discussed it. A couple of theories as to why perhaps these coastal communities have more. Um, and it, it, it ranges, but could you share the, with us watching what some of those theories are? Sure. Um, well, some of the theories. One being the most medically sound is the. Uh, Convalescent homes tend to have a higher rate. So we have several convalescent homes and elderly residential facilities here in Newport Beach that tend to have a higher rate. But there's a conventional thinking amongst the county health that it's also largely access to health care. And our residents here in Newport Beach and Laguna Beach tend to, to have um, more access to health care than some other associates economically depressed areas in the in the county. So when somebody um, here in Newport Beach becomes ill, we have close access to Hope Hospital and and the testing. So it would stand a reason that our folks um, can go to Hope Hospital and, and get tested. Maybe some other parts of the county they're not as apt to to go get tested. Thank you. So uh, the message I'm just the closing point I'm trying to make, and of course, you know, uh, welcome back to the hot seat, Chief. It's you're uh, you're improving already. I guess Lewis has been telling you some tips how to testify. Um, is that there is no reason if you're if you're worried about disproportionate positive tests in Newport Beach, if there's a likely correlation having to do with uh, housing situations for retired individuals and access to quality health care. Both Hogue is an amazing institution and in simple proximity to how close you are to to uh, to being treated. Um, I guess I just wanted to make that point because I think it's beneficial to people to know that there's nothing to be afraid of if you um, if you wash your hands consistently, you isolate yourself if you are uh, on the older end or if you have some uh, immune deficiencies. Uh, you be a good neighbor. You wear a face mask. Um, you're going to be interacting with people in any close distance, like the mayor just showed us. Um, and uh, you do your best to uh, to be considerate of others. And I am very eager, and I'm hearing a lot of news nationally, both in the states of New England and in, uh, in the federal level, that we're about to get ready to get back to business. And uh, I think when that happens, the role of government really is going to be to get out of the way. Obviously, there's some things we can do to help, but um, I am eager with I'm eager to get back to business. And I think a lot of people are, of course, with caution. So there are many emails that we get, and we have we see both sides. It's our job to try to see the balance in it. I'm starting to see a lot of the anxiety in the community also um, slow down. So I think with that, uh, we're going to be seeing soon um, a shift to how to return to life, of course, following some of the uh, instructions still until enough people are um, either have the, um, the immunity or vaccinated from this. And of course, our team, the fire, police, our staff, uh, will be educated, work on educating everyone on what that process is going to look like, uh, as well with the federal and states. Um, so, Chief, Chief, just I guess the last question to you is, you, you are probably the most, the head of the most frontline department as far as dealing with people um, who are sus infected or suspect they're infected, as opposed to police who may not as often in that case. Is morale high in your department? It is, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm glad you asked that because I was just 
going to weigh in on that. So you, you lobbed me a softball there. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that although uh, first responders and healthcare workers, obviously it's a dangerous position to be in, we don't have, currently have any one of our 120 sworn personnel um, symptomatic or tested positive. I've had three come down with symptoms that were tested. Uh, that was a week or two ago, and they were both or they're all negative. So my point being from your fear comment that with proper social distancing, hand washing, these guys have training and they have PPE, but they're in direct contact with known positive COVID people and, and it hasn't been transmitted. So it can be minimized and reduced if you pay attention. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that good news and God bless you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to actually to, to support to support, to support what you've been saying, Mr. Muldoon, I'll just point um, last couple of weeks, the, all the mayors of every city have gotten on a phone call on, at thurs, on Thursday nights. And then on Friday mornings, um, Michelle Steele, our supervisor, Michelle Steele has been putting mayor's calls together for her district. And the number, the number one complaint from cities outside of our area has been lack of access to testing. Uh, and my understanding is the county the county has only been processing around, the county lab only processes around 80 a day. So when you see anything more than that, which you see anywhere between 600 and 1,000, those are being done in private labs, such as such as Hogue. And so we haven't heard the same complaint in our area. So now all of a sudden, a lot of the other cities are getting access to testing. And you've seen some of the cities jumping 60 in the, la in the last week, 60, 50, 40, 30, and things like that. You've seen Newport and right around 10. Or so, and and so that I think you've I think you hit the nail on the head on that one. All right, uh, Ms. Brenner. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say to everyone out there that as we sit here and we talk very calmly and rationally about all of the things that are going on, it's not lost on us that everyone has been panicked and in a state of uh, extreme frustration. And um, I just want you to know that this, there was no playbook for this. There was no way that we could know ahead of time or that Grace could know ahead of time what it was that she was going to be up against. And it has been constantly evolving. Um, I think the, the people in Diane's and Jeff's and my district who were the most dramatically affected on the front lines were the most frustrated. and. We, heard, we read all those emails, we took your phone calls, we understand, and our response has been continually evolving. It's like, we will try this, and if that doesn't work, we'll try that. And, and we're just constantly looking at ways to be more and more effective. And, um, and, and at some point, perhaps on a future agenda, we could put on there a discussion item about resident only parking because we are constantly getting suggestions from people that we need to implement that and believe me if we had magic wands we would have done that a long time ago but um it just it wasn't possible and so i'd like for us to talk about that at some point in the future to have it in place if something like this ever comes about again, so we can talk about what the pros and cons are and what our limitations are. But um, it's something that that we, um, you know, we've all taken this extremely seriously. And I just wanted to say that when at the city we get something called WARN letters, W-A-R-N, for people out there that don't know about this. I didn't know about it until this started happening. But the city gets letters from companies that are having to lay people off. And it's really sobering to get as many of those letters as we do and see the number of people in our own community that are being um, laid off and let go. And, and so we're doing everything that we can do to get over this crisis as quickly as possible. And we appreciate those of you who are doing your part by wearing masks and by social distancing and walking six feet behind people. Um, We've made a lot of adjustments in the beachfront areas, which seem to be the most heavily impacted. And 
We were able to make some serious adjustments at the wedge and the boardwalk and the island and West Newport and Ocean Boulevard has been frustrating for us because Corona Del Mar is built to get people to the ocean. It, it's, if we just had one access point, it would be so much easier, but we've got every street basically leads to Ocean Boulevard. And so it's been frustrating for all of us as we've been trying to deal with that. But I appreciate all the constructive emails that we've gotten and constructive phone calls where people are saying, could you try this or thank you for doing that? Um, we get the, the nasty ones as well, but we, I think we listen better when people don't call us stupid. And so um, <laughs> we, we actually are paying attention and we're trying to make every adjustment that we can. And um, I, I also wanted to say that I think it's easy to not take this too seriously when you're not in one of those really impacted areas. And I don't know, Leilani, do we have the slides of Ocean Boulevard that we could show? Because I think a lot of our council members and our citizens don't realize what they're dealing with down on Ocean Boulevard and have been at the wedge and, and everything. So if we could show those, that would be helpful. And I'll just keep talking in the meantime. But um, I've suggested to many people to not just email your district representative about these problems because because of the Brown Act, we can't, I can't get on a phone call with all my other council members and say, we're really suffering down here on Ocean Boulevard. I can only talk to two other council members about things. So it's really important when you send an email that you send it to city council at newportbeachca.gov so that everybody sees those pictures and those videos and knows what it is that we're dealing with. Um, and um, one other question that I had for, I don't know, is John Lewis still there? I wanted to ask him a question about enforcement because the people who are working so hard to follow the rules and regulations, here, here we have pictures of Ocean Boulevard. And um, as you can see, it's like a nightmare down there. I have said to everybody that will listen to me who complains that they can't go walking down there I know, I don't walk there anymore. It's not safe. We can't keep you safe down there. So of all times in the world, hopefully we have the rest of our lives to go walk Ocean Boulevard. But in the meantime, walk the other streets, walk the streets. I walk in my neighborhood north of the highway and it's been great because I have gotten to know neighbors that I didn't know before and I walk up the hill instead of going down the hill, and it's very calm and serene up there. And so I think in some of the council districts, it's pretty peaceful and quiet, and it's hard to really recognize how frustrating and, and really dangerous it is in places like Ocean Boulevard, and it was at the Wedge until we got some changes made there. So um, I, just, I just wanted to, um, make sure that everybody knew about that. And then in closing, I wanted to say that um, there are a lot of blessings out of this. And I hope we don't lose the blessings because we're so frustrated by the challenges. But I've heard from so many people, including my own children, that their family time has been extraordinary and that they're having more dinners together than they've ever had. And, um, they're resting. We're getting to know our neighbors. We, um, we really are feeling gratitude for our lives as they normally are. Uh, it's like now we look back on the times where we were running around crazy and maybe complaining about all the meetings we had to go to or everything that we were doing, thinking, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't even wait to get back to city council to be with all of you guys in the council chambers. So I think there are a lot of blessings that that have come out of all of this. And uh, I just wanted to give kudos to Mayor O'Neill for the um, the children's reading that you did. What was the name of the of the fish book that you read? I've yeah. heard people 
The pow pow fish, yeah. Pow pow fish, that they really appreciated that. So anyway, I appreciate our city staff so much and our medical and our emergency personnel. And, and John, I just wanted to ask you, um, what do we say to people when people who are doing the right thing and are frustrated because they're seeing people walking without masks and in big groups and construction workers that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So what do we tell our residents about that? Well, to begin, we share the frustration because we hear the complaints from our residents as well. And we're doing what we can legally do to, to impact this. And I think that we've seen some of our education efforts have been helpful, but we haven't gotten all the way there yet. And so this is something that's still going to be a work in progress. But I will say that with some of the closures that we've had, with some of the measures that we've taken with our public works teams that allowed us to um, take some more control over some of these spaces where we're having problems, we have impacted those. And we've been able to um, discourage some of the gatherings. The unintended consequence, perhaps, in some of these areas, and I know in Corona Mar, that has been one of them, is that we push maybe some pedestrian traffic onto the streets that were no longer impacted, and we're continuing to to work through that. So I, I can tell you this, we are trying every thoughtful and creative and out-of-the-box solution to try to impact this and, and take care of our residents and protect them and also be respectful of their other property rights while maintaining public safety here. So it's a work in progress. It's something that we're um, working on just about every day, um, multiple times a day, coming up with different ways that we can that we can take care of these concerns. And that's something that I know your city manager is highly invested in and also your public works director as well, um, a conversation we're having on a daily basis. So we're trying to impact it, we're trying to get better, and we still have some work to do, absolutely, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Duffield, anything from you? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just uh, wanted, of course, to say <clears throat> a great shout out and thanks to Grace. Man, we talked about it a little bit yesterday, <laughs> how timing, life is timing, and and she got into this role uh, at a at an interesting time. Whew. So I want to thank staff. I mean, of course, there's no protocols to this. So, um, you know, we've we've never been in this situation before. So it's 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 a dynamic situation, and I appreciate how the everyone's working together. And I want everyone to know to hang in there, and uh, just to know that all of the city council supports 100% of our city staff, our, of course our man, city manager, and above all, our mayor. I, I can't think of a better mayor. Uh, okay, maybe you, Kevin. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just saying youthful mayors at this time are very helpful. Us old mayors, we, we, we are struggling here with the, with the technology and of course this, the virus itself, but, I just, just want to say uh, how grateful I am to our mayor, uh, Will O'Neill, who is just uh, so technologically advanced and helping and, and, and just so uh, sincere and humble. I, I, I support him 100%, and I think that's uh, what we all do. I know we all do. And, and Will, keep going, man. And Grace, keep going. And Aaron, everybody, I, I just, I'm 100% behind you. And, uh, We'll get through this. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you. All right, Mr. Avery. Well, as everybody knows, a, a crisis like this really brings out who you really are and who organizations really are, who cities really are. And, you know, I, I know we have many people that are going through a tough time and we get emails that sometimes are pretty rough, but, you know, I, I kind of see that as just coming through through fear. And uh, I, I, I just think one of the big things we can all do is just be as kind as we can to other people in the market, uh, uh, to our neighbors, just to, um, this is, I think this has given all of us a time to reflect on what our lives are like and you know, around our town, there's a lot of hurry up, but we're, we're going a mile a minute. And here we have some time to to um, think. And I think all of us have been doing a lot of thinking uh, about various things uh, related to our lifestyle. But you really have to be unthinking not to realize how fortunate we are to live in this town with all the resources, all the good people. And sometimes when I see the letters, 
I, I understand their frustration, but I, I sometimes wonder, you know, you know, we've got a really good team here at the city and we're really trying. I can just say that um, because I know our city manager and our mayor um, trying to make the right decisions, not to overreach and take freedoms away from people, but yet put enough in there to protect people. And that balance is being worked on all the time by our police, fire, lifeguards. It is constant effort and it's never been more effort than there is right now. And it's because I think we've just done a terrific job, this city over the years uh, of hiring right people and developing a culture, a civic culture that is professional, it's caring, and uh, it's, it's getting us through this. That's what's so important. And we also get that reflection from residents, so many residents that uh, send us kind emails and who say kind things to us poor council people <laughs> in a time like this. Um, and we know it's an honor to be a council member and it's an honor to be a part of a solution trying to make things better. So um, uh, from my perspective, uh, it, although times are so difficult, I think it's going well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I'll wrap it up by just uh, touching on something we haven't touched a, a ton on quite yet, which is our business community. Um, and I'll just say, I mean, I, I know our, we all know on the council that the, our business community is being just decimated right now um, with single digit, uh, single digits at our hospitality industry, seeing our, our restaurants, a lot of them shuttered, um, barely holding on by just providing uh, curbside pickup and, and delivery. Uh, all the bars are closed. A lot of our businesses are closed and uh, We've we've had by by virtue of the pandemic and where we have been by, you know, county and the um, state orders and guidances, we've had to be for the last month creative in closures, uh, and we have been very creative in closures, and now that we seem to have at least reached a, a point of somewhat equilibrium, although we continue to look, um, we, we will continue to assess throughout the city. We've got to start thinking about being creative and openings. Um, and what I mean by that is I don't anticipate just a, a open the doors so and everything goes back to normal anytime soon. But but I do anticipate a, a phased in approach, at least given by the governor. And as the as the governor continues to phase that in, we need to be ready. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. So. I did a one earlier a uh, committee, and I look forward to at least trying to raise that at the council level. But for folks in the business community, you don't have to wait for a committee to start making suggestions to us on how to jumpstart your business back into shape. Um, if there are regulations that we have on our books that you think we need to ease, um, let us know. Uh, if there are things that the, the city can be doing to anticipate the coming, you know, the coming reopening, however that that looks, let us know that too, uh, because we've got to get people back to work. We've got to get people back up and running again, because uh, we've always been an industrious city. We've always had people who are entrepreneurs and uh, to stifle that for, for you know, longer than would be necessary would be a travesty in our city. And so um, we need, we're gonna need a, a lot of help to get us back there. So. Anyway, I, this is a uh, this is a discussion on the item, so um, I uh, sh I'll just complete the complete it by saying exactly what everyone else has been saying, which is to our residents, thank you to our businesses, we're we're gonna be there for you, and then to our staff, a big thank you too. Um, you're you're doing you're doing uh, a lot of work we never anticipated, but uh, you're doing it efficiently, so I appreciate that. So uh, with that, we're gonna move on to the next item, which is item number three that I pulled out. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to go public comment. I apologize, sorry, I need to go to public comment. Um, quick reminder, uh, the, comment, the public comment number on this is 949-270-8175. Uh, and uh, so what we'll do first is we'll start with uh, the public comment in the community room. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. This is Jim Mosher again. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank the city for continuing to make the community room available during this crisis so that even the most technologically challenged citizens have at least uh, some opportunity to participate in your meetings. I don't think the option was very well advertised. Perhaps in the future it will be better. And as to the finance committee meeting that's coming up on Thursday, which will be discussing the fiscal impact of the shutdown on the city, there will be a problem with that because although the city is having only two further meetings for the public this week, that finance committee meeting is being held simultaneously with the zoning administrator meeting, which will be held in the community room and available for as many as 10 people at a time to attend. So I'm not sure how that will be worked out. I also wanted to commend the city on providing the phone-in option tonight. I was hoping it would be better utilized than it has been. I did want to mention about that the agenda makes it sound like the phone-in option is something that is new, novel, and temporary, as novel as the coronavirus and somehow tied to the governor's order. That could be true. I'm not sure if it is. It seems strange to me that the Brown Act would ever have prohibited the public from phoning in comments, even though the council has not in the past had a mechanism for doing that. It seems to me like an interesting possibility for the future. And I tried reading the Brown Act today. It's not clear on what its requirement is, but it would be good to get clarity on whether that could be used in the future after the crisis passed. And finally, as to the conduct of the meetings, if they are being, being conducted electronically, I would recommend it's not a good idea to dispense with the staff reports because the public members who are at home who don't have the benefit of the agenda do not know what you're voting on. I noticed on item 10, based on what I saw here in the community room on the screen, the public at home was invited to comment, but they had no idea what the item was until the clerk read the ordinances at the end, saying it had to do with setbacks for a property on Seashore Drive. So as a courtesy to the people listening at home, if the meetings are being held this way, it would be good to be clear and have staff reports on everything. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Yes, this is Jalil Shabazz Blue again. I'm, um, just want to comment on the businesses that are closed. Uh, well, some are closed and others are, they have lines outside the stores. It's very, very casual and um, helpful. But the thing I'm really pushing towards is uh, getting you guys to notice that enough people walking, as, as you saw on around Beach Boulevard, uh, it can cause, cause a number of uh, cases to occur. But on that, is this business closing, is it gonna affect the future with our development in um, education on technology. Just really straight out there. If I could ask this question. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any call-ins? Yeah, we have two. Okay, great. So we'll take the first call. All right. So if you can, uh, if you can hear me on the phone, go right ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Jonathan O'Connell, uh, calling uh, regarding uh, what you recently were speaking about. Um, as, as Mr. Avery was stating earlier, I think this opportunity um, and this crisis is is providing um, really a, a a window to see who leaders really are uh, during this crisis. I think the the veil. Uh, is being removed from a lot of local uh, leaders, not just in in, uh, in our city, but other uh, counties and uh, those that surround us in Southern California, where we're really seeing sort of where the egos are and where the true voices of the people lie. 
and that's really critical here. Um, I, I just want to remind you, though, that you're hearing a lot of good things coming from kind of the going forward plan, but there's always going to be complainers, right? There are always going to be hysterics. You know this as leaders that we can't make decisions based out of fear and emotion, but they have to be thoughtful and represent the majority of the people who are calm, who are thoughtful, and who are really respecting the requests um, to practice the physical distancing and the other requests of, of leadership. I walk the beach every day, and with my son, we're out there on the beach with my wife, and I see people who are keeping in their own space. They're not abusing um, the requests, but there's always going to be those people who are calling you hysterical, saying what you're doing is never enough. But please don't let the loud, loud voice of the minority and of those that are so hysterical guide you and your judgment and your leadership and all those of us who really want to see us get back to work. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next speaker. Um, okay. All right. If you're on the phone and you can hear my voice, please begin. All right. If you're on the laptop. Phone, yep. Go ahead. I'm here. They're not abusing. Can you hear me? Yeah. Could you please mute? I don't know whatever you're listening to. Do you want me to mute my laptop? Yes, please. Okay. It's muted. All right. Great. Please begin. Hi, uh, my name is Dick Paglia, and I'm a relatively new resident uh, in Newport Beach. I live on Seashore Drive. And first of all, I want to say I love Newport Beach. Uh, I think it's a fabulous community. It offers so much. The, the, the library is the most amazing library I've ever been to. Um, the beaches are just amazing. They're well kept and well staffed. And I also want to say, I think uh, the town has been doing a lot of good things with regards to this virus and how we've had to change our lives to, to make sure people aren't suffering and dying. And I think the, the town itself has been very successful in doing that, uh, shown by the numbers that are, are posted daily. Um, so I just wanted to start off with just, I, I think it's, it's great. I love living here and I tell all my friends back east from where I'm from about it. Um, I do have a, a little bit of a concern that doesn't, I think, need to take anyone's freedom away. And, um, and it just recently came out by the CDC and the, the World Health Organization that they're really asking everyone over the age of two to wear cloth masks covering their nose and mouth when outside. And I don't think that's too much to ask of people um, to do. Um, it's not mandatory in Ocean, in Orange County, uh, but I know Newport Beach strongly recommends it. But again, there's no mandate for people to do that. Now, where I live on Seashore Drive, it's very much like it is on Ocean Boulevard that Joy Brenner was talking about. If you were to come down here on the weekends and there's good weather, the Seashore Drive is just packed with runners, skateboarders, joggers. And I, I think those are all great things. I get out and exercise myself every day. But I wear a mask, and so does my wife. And I think it would, it might just save someone's life. It just might, because they know that this virus can be airborne and that it can be, you can get it airborne. It's a relatively low percentage, very low, I understand, but it's still a possibility. Um, the other thing that I've noticed in when I do go out to shop is that many of the grocery stores that I go to, I don't just go to one. I, there's several that I need to go to. And I have found that the employees there are not wearing masks. And that concerns me uh, because then you're in a confined area where there is a, a higher likelihood 
uh, catching this virus. So my question to you is, has the council thought of mandating uh, the wearing of these masks? And, and if not, um, why not? And if you did decide to mandate wearing them, would you be willing to enforce that law? All right. And um, that's about much. all I have to say. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. We have uh, one more speaker. All right. And okay. If you can hear me, you can go, you can start your public comment. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. This is Charles Klobe again. I'm calling to echo uh, Mr. Mosher's comments and also to report to you that, um, as you know, all of you I'm sure know, I'm a board member of Spawn. And more than a month ago, we began holding our monthly board meetings via video conference. What we discovered early on was the greater participation by board members via video conference. And I know you have had the technology to allow audience call in for some time, and it hasn't been used. I think going forward, you might consider the ability to have audience call in as a regular component during um, council meetings, just as you're experiencing now. You might get greater participation from folks that aren't able to attend in person, but have constructive information to offer. And thank you for your service. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we have another caller in. Okay, uh, all right, if you can hear me, then uh, you can start your public comment. So if you're on the phone and you can hear me, please begin. Hi, is anyone on the phone? <clears throat> Okay. All right. Go Good ahead. Evening. Thank you. Good evening, uh, City Council. Uh, my name is uh, Max Johnson, and I am a resident of uh, Babel Peninsula. And I'm calling tonight because I live a block before the wedge, and I just wanted to uh, communicate my gratitude. Um, I know my community, uh, and I have noticed the changes and the benefits with posting the signs at the wedge and closing down the wedge as well as M Street Beach entrance. But the one comment that I wanted to make or have a request would be to have city staff potentially put more signs at L Street Park, or excuse me, not L Street Park, but the L Street Beach entrance. That's the current entrance that is basically kind of um, the first entrance before the wedge where we're seeing a large majority of people just as in uh, Joy's district on Ocean Boulevard coming down uh, in the hordes. And I don't think we're looking to, to want to close the beach, but I think it would be beneficial to have staff posting the six feet signs um, at that entrance, just because um, from the Babo up here down to the peninsula, L Street, and uh, there's really only two or three other um, access points via um, the beach there. And so um, every night myself and neighbors are going out to the sunset and uh, generally our blocks are completely full with cars. So I just uh, would like to ask if staff can maybe put time just to notify people, hey, keep your distance. Um, and uh, I think it would just help uh, people remember that. Um, but again, I just wanted to say thank you also to um, Diane uh, and staff for, for listening to um, all the comments that um, I know my district um, has been making. And uh, yeah, I commend Grace um, and uh, all other city staff for doing a really good job during this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, that completes public comments. Oh, I'm sorry, one more? All right, we got one more. Um, okay. Uh, so if you can hear me on the phone right now, you can begin your public comments. Is anyone on the phone? Okay, go ahead. If you're on the phone, go ahead. 
Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Buzz. Um, I'm on the uh, peninsula, a resident here for uh, 40 years. Um, I appreciate everything you guys have done here to uh, help us through this horrible situation with the COVID uh, virus. Um, I just hope we're all prepared as the weather becomes nicer and a lot more people will be coming down here to this beach area. As you all know, um, I think it's the uh, L.A. County area have closed their beaches entirely. You've got cities like Costa Mesa that have mandated uh, masks to be worn. And uh, I realize what we've done so far has been adequate, but um, we're not out of the woods yet. And we need your leadership to be sure that um, we don't uh, make a situation worse. Thank you for everything you've done. All right. Thank you. Okay, no more. All right, so we'll close public comment. Uh, it did remind me that there had been a question during non-agenda about the Finance Committee and the technology that I failed to come back around to. Yes, uh, the Finance Committee this week will be done via WebEx, similar to what we're seeing right now, and there will be a call-in option. And also, I, um, uh, there is the opportunity, if you, if you feel the need to come in to um, City Hall to make your public comments. There is the ability to, there, there will be a conference room for in-person comments uh, for the Finance Committee. So I would recommend you reach out to our Finance Committee, or our Finance um, Director. His contact information is actually on the agenda. So with that, I thank you, and we'll move on to item number three. So item number three, uh, I think what we'll do with item number three first is kick it over to Mr. Uh, Harp to explain just briefly what this item is trying to do. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. So this resolution is basically starting to look at potentially four different items. Um, and this is just the initiation. So nothing's actually being proposed at this point. It's just to send it down to planning commission for them to take a look at the land use regulations related to tattoo parlors, lodging density, as well as um, sales in, in the uh, industrial district. So that's kind of what they're, what they're looking at. And I'd be happy to answer any specific questions you have. Yeah, I think just, so this, is, this is for my fellow council members as a matter of procedure. I think what we're gonna do is we'll break out the, each of the four items. Um, to make sure that we have an understanding of uh, whether we have people who want to support each one of these, sufficient number of people to support each one of these because these are rather different. Um, I suppose you could get a tattoo in a short-term lodging, but um, anyway, I, so yeah, I hope that's, that's a kid. That's a very much a joke. I know it's, anyway, anyway but, but I wanna, but I think I, well, I'd like to break them out. So um, anyway, I'm gonna, what I'll do is um, I'd like to just kind of run through each one. And if you have questions about each, each individual one, we'll, uh, we'll take them one at a time and then we can go out to public comment and then we can go uh, and bring it back for uh, motions on the, each individual topic. So let's just start with um, tech services. I think there, I've got two and then I'll open it up to questions from council. First question I've got is, um, I'm reading between the lines here, it, you're, you're saying that our current code needs to be updated. It doesn't appear to be in line with the First Amendment case law that uh, um, that uh, has come out from the Ninth Circuit. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, so the Ninth Circuit has said that tattooing is um, expressive activity that's fully protected by the First Amendment. And what we'd be looking at is what are appropriate time, place, and manner restrictions um, to that, to that uh, business. Yeah, and so the, the question that Mr. Moser brought up, which I thought was actually, was, was a good one, was um, the, the description is to remove discretionary aspects of the approval. Uh, but his question was, is there a possibility where the city would be reaching content neutral discretionary decisions? And does this remove those kinds of discretionary decisions from the process? No, I don't think so. The planning commission will have all the options available to them as long as it's in conformance with, with the law. So I think it's really taking a look at, at uh, what are the 
you know, potential impacts associated with these businesses? Are there appropriate, you know, um, basically time, place, and manner restrictions that are in line with the First Amendment protections? So I think that it's pretty broad what you're doing. Um, I think the staff report was just kind of generally describing um, the state of the state of the law related there too. Um, but Simone can probably add more, uh, I believe it's his staff report. Uh, is Simone still with us? All right. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't need to add, until, unless, unless a council member requests it, I, I won't ask for additional comments from Mr. Drews quite yet, but the, um, and I guess the only other point to be made for all four of these topics we're gonna be discussing, it would first have to go to planning commission, then the city council. That's right. So go to planning commission and then uh, they would put a recommendation for city council and then you would consider it. Okay. All right. And then, uh, okay. Those were the questions I had. Um, do I have any questions from any council members on this, on the tattoo initiation? May I just have a clarifying question? Yep, go ahead. Aaron, just to clarify what you just said to follow up. So on the tattoo, it's just to tighten up our code in conjunction with the LCP and all of our codes to line up because we had a tattoo, a couple tattoo matters in the last 12 months. We didn't have these code changes. These code, what will this, had we had them, what would, would, would have been different? Well, I think what, it does, what we're looking to do is the, the code sections are, are um, pre Ninth Circuit decisions. So we're looking to bring our code into line with what the Ninth Circuit has, uh, has held, as well as what other regulations may be appropriate. So I think we're taking a comprehensive look at this, but there will be need to be some adjustments to bring us in line with current uh, case law. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a fair point, though, because um, I recall during those, those hearings that one of the issues we had was, was um, trying to navigate through a, uh, you know, a code provision that potentially didn't comply but we were we were following the ninth circuit case law yeah. during that process so to to council member dixon's point even assuming that we were we passed something that applied to the first amendment there's still the ability for someone for example to appeal a zoning administrator's decision to the planning commission and then potentially appeal the planning commission decision to the council it, all of that under a uh, content neutral approach if i if i'm understanding that correctly. I think that's correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? Okay. I'm going to move next to the density bonus. This might be a Simone question. So, Mr. Jurgis, could you explain your thought process in terms of the density bonus, bringing this forward? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, density bonus it it, it changes often um, with regards to state law. So our code has actually fallen out of date. Um, any applicant currently with a, a developer that is requesting a kind of a density bonus um, on their project. We will have to, we have to turn to our to state law to make ensure that it's compliant. So what the, this request is to just update our code to be in conformance to the current state laws with regards to density bonus. Better, huh? Okay. All right. Um, any, any questions from council on this issue? All right, I don't see any. All right, let's bring it down to short-term lodging. Um, I'm not sure I have any questions on this. Does any, does any, do any council members have any questions on this particular item? Can I just yes. clarify? Dixon. So Simone, as long as you're sitting there too, so we uh, still have an ad hoc committee on short-term lodging and we will be, that's with Mr. Herdman, Ms. Brenner and myself and We'll be meeting uh, shortly, and the intent is to make the recommended, proposed recommended changes, and then bring it forward to council the end of this month. Is that, am I saying that correctly? April 28th is the next meeting? So we're going to come back with an, uh, uh, kind of our phase one of an uh, update to the short term lodging ordinance in second meeting of May. That's our proposed schedule. Tonight's item is to initiate code changes that are not going to be in the update in May, because we ensure that we are changing both our zoning code and our coastal code. You know, we the council has talked about in the past, you know, imposing a cap um, uh, of short term lodging up to 1600, requiring one parking space, um, implementing kind of a, a more restrictive occupant load standard. 
and establishing a minimum minimum night stay for short-term lodging. So we want to initiate that code change. We want to write the code in both zoning and coastal and come go through the planning commission and then back to city council. You know, we're, we're not going to come back in May for these changes. That This is going to come probably about four to, about four to six months but by the time we come back to the city council for the phase two of the short-term lodging ordinance. Okay, I said April, I meant May. Yeah, okay, yes. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All right, any other questions on this? Okay, food and alcohol service and industrial zone. I know, um, I know, Simone, you were looking for clarification on, on this item. So could you kind of walk through what you're, what you're seeking in terms of? Yes, yeah, sir, thank you. Um, this is um, Councilmember Muldoon requested it through an A1, which there was support from the city council to update the industrial zone to allow alcohol and food, food service. Currently, the industrial zone only allows manufacturing of food or alcohol. It does not allow the sale of food or alcohol. What we'd like from the council is the, the council's input and feedback on, you know, is this what kind of restrictions we'd like to see? Um, where would you like to see this item go forward? Because we will take your input, we'll write the code change, and come back for the planning commission's consideration and then the city council's consideration. So your input this evening will help guide us uh, how to write the, the code change specifically for the industrial zone. Okay. Um, so I guess I should ask, Mr. so Mr. Muldoon, this was your A1, so I wanted to at least give you the opportunity to try to clarify some of the, any of the points that our staff was looking for on this item. Okay, uh, can I address the time of the motion? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I, I, at that time, I'll just say one of my questions on this item was we had had a similar discussion on this a couple of years ago when we were trying to work through tasting rooms. And at the time I was really trying hard to find a way to get, um, I think a lot of people were trying to find a good way to get tasting rooms into Newport, similar to the way that uh, Anaheim had done. Um, and, I, and I recall one of the big question marks in the industrial zone being so many schools in the area. And so at the time that I hadn't gone through and so I was trying to figure out um, It'd be great to know the difference between what you're proposing and what we had looked at a couple of years ago uh, to try to understand what the what the proposal is. So, uh, let's see. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Then what we'll do is we'll go out to public comment on this. Um, public comment. The I apologize. Let me get my phone number. So on this item, uh, the, the phone number for public comment is 949-270-8165. Just out of curiosity, it, the phone number has been showing up on the screen. Have we checked that? Oh, great. All right, I just want, I probably should check that earlier. So again, the last numbers on this one are 8165. If you have any comments at all on any of these four items, um, please call in. Uh, we'll start with public comment in the community room. Do we have any public comment on this item in the community room? Okay, seeing none. Do we have any public comment on the phone? I'll give it a, about 10 seconds just to give it a bit of a delay. No, okay. All right. Okay, we have no public comment on this item, so we'll uh, bring it back to the dais. So on initiation, so we'll start with, apologies, okay, we'll start with the tattoo services issue. Um, does anyone want to make a motion for staff recommendation on uh, tattoo services? <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm here, O'Neill. This, this is uh, Citrin. Uh, we've broken this up into four separate resolutions, so you can actually uh, have potentially a motion on each different item uh, with a separate resolution. I think that's what we'll do. I think it just makes sense to do it that way. So, Mr. Bondude made the motion, and I'll make the second. Um, do we have any discussion on this item? I just wanted to make the sound like that this is a conformity with the uh, U.S. Constitution and case law on the Ninth Circuit. 
agreed 100%. That's why I'm going to second that one. Um, all right. So what we'll do is we'll go uh, we'll go a roll call vote on this, Mr. Herdman. Aye. Ms. Dixon. Aye. Mr. Muldoon. Aye. Ms. Brenner. Aye. Uh, Mr. Duffield. Aye. Mr. Avery. Aye. And I'll be an aye as well. All right, on density bonuses to conform to state law, uh, do I have a motion to for staff recommendation on this item? So moved. All right. moved by Ms. Dixon, seconded by Ms. Brenner? Yes. Okay. All right, any discussion? All right, seeing none, um, take a roll call vote. Mr. Herdman? Aye. Ms. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Muldoon? Uh, Ms. Brenner? Aye. Uh, Mr. Duffield? Aye. Mr. Avery? Aye. I'll be an aye as well. On uh, short-term lodging initiation, um, do I have a motion on this? I'll so move. All right, Mr. Herdman? Second. All right, seconded by Ms. Brenner. Um, she beat you by this much. <laughs> uh, so uh, do we have any discussion on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Herdman? Aye. Ms. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Muldoon? No. Mr. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Brenner? Aye. Uh, Mr. Duffield? Aye. Mr. Avery? Aye. I'll be an aye as well. And then on the last item, I'm going to, yeah, I'll, I'll give the floor over to Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. For those uh, who are watching at home, this is a continuing start of the conversation. This is not a final item. As the mayor pointed out, we explored something similar to this a couple of years ago. I was not aware that we'd be losing a business uh, if we did not amend um, our zoning to allow essentially a uh, light like and opportunity. Um, there's a current business that exists, and um, now is a, I can't think of a better time to fight for every business in Newport Beach to be able to legally operate. This business is willing to reduce their hours um, to avoid any school activity, including school time, after school times, or sport activities. If you ever have a chance to go to this location, you'll see that it's um, it's not your typical uh, drinking establishment or bar. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, it's a very um, you know, almost club-oriented feel, and uh, it's, it's, it's basically um, has, has members. Uh, of course, members of the public can go as well, uh, but it's, 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 it's nothing like what you would picture um, the traditional liquor establishment we were voting on this item a couple of years ago. So in the interest of protecting the business and uh, working in the local, local economy, I would like to um, allow this to continue to operate. So I will make a motion uh, on this item. Okay. Um, do we have a second? So I'm sorry, what the, is the motion? The only reason I'm seeking clarification on this was because staff had sought clarification. And so making a recommendation of staff recommendation is not quite, it might not quite be enough. So that's why I was trying to seek clarification in terms of which, what Mr. Sturgis was um, seeking. Well, uh, when I spoke to Simone earlier today, I didn't Maybe it was yesterday. I didn't know he needed clarification, but I am not seeking essentially what's called spot zoning, um, which sort of gets um, a bad rap. Although I don't think it's such a big problem. I'm more of a free enterprise um, proponent, but this is not spot zoning. This is essentially making um, uh, a different rule for areas that are zoned industrial. We're talking about a very small zone um, over um, on the border of Costa Mesa. Uh, and um, maybe someone could you please let me know what more staff uh, direction you would like? So I can put the motion. Thank you, um, Councilmember Muldoon. You know, you, you brought up a couple uh, points already in your comments about um, re re um, restricting hours of operation. So I, I think we've, we've gotten those comments. You talk about the, the club feel with membership. So we, we got those comments. Um, so those, those help us a lot. I didn't know if there was a um, occupancy, um, maximum occupancy that you were considering or not. Um, and this is just mainly for um, an alcohol of beer and wine versus full um, full liquor. I think I think they're like maybe those two clarifications of occupant load and, and whether it's just beer and wine only. Perfect. Thank you for that. And now I understand. 
Um, yeah, so the, uh, my motion would include restricted hours that um, are not uh, in conflict with any school hours. Um, Max democracy would that would be uh, whatever actually occupancy you would put for a similar business or industry based on the square footage and, and the safety as you see fit. Um, so 100% deference to fire and uh, building in that department. Uh, this would definitely be uh, purely for beer and wine. It is essentially um, wine tasting establishments. Um, and uh, is there anything else I missed, Simone? <laughs> Sorry, Simone, I apologize. I think you were muted. So, so. Oh, sorry. I, yeah, I go ahead. Thank you. Um, is there a difference with regards to just basic food prep or actually cooking of food? Um, when we say food service, is there, is there a difference um, in, in your mind? Well, yeah, what they have now is almost, um, I don't think they have a full kitchen. I don't think that they would, that they would need one or are requesting one. So this would be similar to um, catering, uh, but I require a full kitchen. That helps, that helps, you understand. All right, any other clarification? Um, I have a second. Yeah. Sorry, hang on just one second. Any, any other clarifications? Um, no, we're good, thank you. All right, and so that's all incorporated into your motion. Thank you. All right, okay, and then Mr. Duffield, you're a second on that? Yes. All right, great. Um, now, just so everyone knows, we apparently did receive a public comment on the phone. What I'm going to do, be, uh, out of fairness, um, I'm going to take a, uh, we're still going to take a roll call vote on this, and then I'm going to allow someone to do the public comment, and then I'm going to ask whether that changes anyone's vote, and then we can re-vote if so. Um, but I'm, I'm just a little unclear on whether the delay caused it or whether the Person called, person called in after I already public closed public comment. So I'm just letting you know, since we've already voted on three, we're gonna vote on the fourth, um, but then I will come back and ask if uh, anyone would like to change their their vote after hearing a uh, public comment. So we're gonna vote on any any comments. Sorry, I wanna make sure I did that before I, we voted on this. Are you taking comments from us? I am. Um, on this, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, so let me let me clarify, that's a fair question. So at this point, um, I'm going to take comments from council on the uh, on the motion on the table. All right, Ms. Okay. Dixon. Well, I, I just want to say that I remember when this item came up about two years ago, and it's the same business owner. I made a site visit there. Um, the circumstances at the time are the same as they are as proposed today, the way they're operating. I believe, Simone, uh, they've been operating outside of a permit now over a year, they were supposed to vacate the premises because they had expanded or their prior owner perhaps had expanded into unpermitted space. Could you clarify that current situation? So, and the city had given them continued extensions to vacate the premises and find an alternative location in an area that was zoned for this type of activity. Could you just augment my facts? Yes, Councilmember Dixon. It, 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 it is a um, an establishment that has morphed over time. Uh, it is a, an ongoing enforcement case that I, I don't want to get into too many of the details. But the underlying issue is that the zoning does not allow for food service. Um, they've changed over time. It is active enforcement. We've given them. Um, you know, we've probably been at this for a little less than a year. With the with the enforcement side, trying to give them some opportunity to um, find a new location, find a an area that they can reestablish themselves, and, and clearly prior post uh, pre pandemic, you know, uh, rents are very high, very expensive. So I think they've been struggling to find a new location. And I remember at the time the issue that I think it was a unanimous vote where the council uh, voted no to change the zoning. Was because parking, residential parking, there are residents who live in the area and the schools and people who came, I remember this distinctly, people who come home from work and there's difficult finding places to park. So I'm, I'm surprised this is coming back again because we did vote unanimously. Um, so that's my comment. Okay. We voted unanimously to disapprove it, to disapprove it, reject it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. Seeing none, we'll uh, take a roll call vote on this item. Uh, Mr. Herdman. Aye. Ms. Dixon. Uh, no. Mr. Muldoon. Aye. Mr. Ms. Brenner. Aye. Mr. Avery. I'm sorry, Mr. Duffield. Aye. Mr. Avery. No. Uh, I'm a no as well, but it passes four to three. All right, so we're going to come back to a uh, public comment on the phone. Um, so are we open on the phone now? Okay. All right. Uh, so are we, uh, uh, if you can hear us on the phone, please begin your public comment. Go ahead with your public comment, please. Hi there. My name is Randy Beck. I'm a I'm resident of Newport Beach. And I was just wanting to comment on the short term uh, rental issue. I have been in contact with Mr. Um, Jurgis and um, also Diane Dixon and um, wrote some other letters to the board. I just, I had good comments going and good uh, relations. And I just, when I heard this tonight, I did not hear an update of what, where we're going from the last meeting I attended because I'm definitely against it. Um, the short-term lodging and some of the issues that were brought up that were a problem, I addressed some of those and brought some different light to the situation as the parking and uh, the people making a noise. A lot of it was not short-term rental yet, people doing it for nine months from the colleges, uh, local colleges and whatnot. So not to get into it in each detail, just one example. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for listening. So, um, so just to quickly uh, note for um, anyone asking about short-term lodging, the uh, the purpose of this was to initiate a, the uh, the code change. And at our next city council meeting in two weeks, our ad hoc subcommittee will be bringing back recommendations for changes. Uh, for those of you who either support or oppose short-term lodging or anything in between. Um, it's a good time to pay attention to the uh, council agenda and recommendations and the council meeting itself. Uh, that will be coming back in two weeks. This was, uh, this, was, this was not to modify the substance of it. This was instead designed to uh, initiate the code change, which is a code requirement. All right. Just, just briefly, uh, Mayor O'Neill, it's actually coming back at the end of May so it'd be about six weeks uh, that the ad hoc committee is coming back with their recommendations. Oh, no. it's, it's the end of May. Sorry, I thought it was the end of April. I misspoke. Oh, okay. All right, the end of May. Okay, um, Madam Clerk. Motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the failing side. All right, do we have any motions for reconsideration? All right, seeing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much.